Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 20th, 2012, and my guest is Robert Skidelsky, author of many books, including a much celebrated biography of John Maynard Keynes. His latest book, co authored with his son Edward, is How Much is Enough Money and the Good Life, which is the subject of today's program. Robert, welcome to Econ Talk. Hello. <laughs> very, very, very glad to be on. Now, you start your book with a discussion of an essay of John Maynard Keynes, quite a provocative and fascinating essay, which is titled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. It was written in 1930 or published in 1930, and it was Keynes's vision for the future, and it's quite an interesting vision. What was that vision? Well, I think basically the vision was that when societies – became sufficiently rich, they would ease off on work. Um, and uh, he he wrote, as you, as you said, in 1930, he, he thought that by now the average standard of living in most societies in the West would be about four or five times higher than in 1930. Uh, machines would, to a large extent, have replaced human labor. So we could achieve this higher standard of working, um, living uh, with, a, with, with a fraction of, of the work we, we then did. And so he actually thought that by now, most of us would only be working about 15 to 20 hours a week. <laughs> uh, and that would be enough, as he put it, to satisfy the old Adam in us. Leisure would replace work as the central activity of the human race. And that was his vision. He was onto something. Uh, he's well, r- he was right he was, about yes. some of that. He was right about some of that. In fact, we have got a lot uh, richer uh, collectively um, than we were in 1930. We're almost in the era of our grandchildren. But the um, the interesting thing is that work hasn't declined nearly as much as he thought it would. And the average hours of work, which were 50 hours or so in 1930, is still about 40 hours. And in, and in recently, they've even been going up a bit in some, some countries like the United States. And um, the, the paradox is also that the rich um, are among the hardest workers. The idea of the idle rich has been uh, replaced by the idea of the workaholic rich. Of course, one of the challenges – one of the challenges with the data on this question is we, we might prefer to look at lifetime hours – uh, so it could be that the rich work very hard in the early and middle part of their life, but maybe maybe they retire earlier. That is one speculation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, if you take if you take the if you take the average um, the length of life as a whole, there's obviously more leisure um, in in a life um, than there used to be because simply from the fact that people live longer. But um, then you ask yourself, I mean, is it really rational to sort of pack in the leisure period of people's lives into their last 15 or 20 years when they're less able, I and mean, that's just through, through, through normal, normal wear and tear, yeah. less able to develop alternative ways of life, um, develop interests which take time to, to mature? Why not spread that leisure a bit more evenly throughout throughout a life. I mean, that would be more rational, I would have thought. You'd think so. Why, why, work, why work very, very hard um, for 30 or 40 years and then sort of almost do nothing in the last 20 years? I think the, uh, the standard economist argument, which uh, I, I agree with you, may not be the rational argument, but that has some rationality to it, of course, is that when your productivity is highest and your reward is highest, yeah. that's when you want to switch your Product, your your work effort, but as you point out, if if your leisure is lousy, it's not a very good deal. Yeah. By the time you come to consume it. Yeah, and and really, uh, uh, how much how much more productivity, how much productivity enhancement should societies be now organised for? I mean, the 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 basic assumption of Keynes is that we actually could afford, as we got richer, to be less efficient, because productivity. 
Uh, productivity is designed to increase economic growth. I mean, output per person rises and rises and rises. And that's then the aim, to increase productivity. But if the aim is, as we suggest, um, to lead a good life, then productivity, uh, concentration on productivity becomes less important less vital. I'm not saying we should deliberately try to be as inefficient as possible, but we shouldn't strive in that direction to the extent we do. Yeah, there's an interesting part of that essay uh, where he he critiques uh, – I'm going to go off, off the subject of your book for a second because I, I, I want to ask the biographer of Keynes this question. He, he critiques in that essay an obsession with purposiveness, of, of goal setting yeah. and always looking to the future – and he, he admits yeah. that compound interest over time will allow us this freedom. But in the meanwhile, we're, we're going to be in this world that, that rewards the, the delay of gratification and the, the, uh, uh, the, the investments that allow us to consume more down the road, which will eventually liberate us. But in the middle of that, he, uh, he's very critical of, of saving, and he's actually very critical yeah. of, of, uh, of Jews – uh, it's a strange passage in there where he critiques the race, speaking, I assume, of the Jews uh, who, who introduced immortality into the world. And also he, he, he also conflates that with the love of money. Uh, and it's – I've always wondered whether his dislike of, of saving in his economic models came somewhere from this feeling that saving wasn't a healthy thing, that, this, that, that living for today was in and of itself a good thing, which is what he's – He's critiquing those who want to live for tomorrow in that. I want to react to that. I'd love yeah, to hear I your think, thoughts. I think he was, I think he was conflicted. I think uh, he, he recognized intellectually uh, in order for capital accumulation to go on, you have to have a, fa- a high savings rate. And, uh, uh, but then but he didn't like saving. He didn't like postponement um, and always looking to the future as a, as a moral or psychological quality. Uh, he he, he um, uh, admitted it was necessary, but he hoped that um, it would give way as quickly as one possibly could to um, enjoyment um, and 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 uh, taking taking uh, taking in, uh, getting enjoyment from what from the present rather than always thinking about the future. I think on on the subject of of Jews and avarice. It was very much a conventional view at the time, That's and he right. wasn't really dogmatic about it because someone pointed out when that essay was written, in fact, it was a Jewish professor from California, I think, who said, look, you've got all this wrong. I mean, Jews rather have been conspicuous, here's another conventional view, from, <laughs> for extravagant display uh-huh. rather than from saving. And um, Keynes immediately wrote back and said, well, you, you're probably right. And I was thinking on conventional lines. But still, I think there's something in the idea that, um, uh, that um, the, the postponement of satisfaction and, 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 and saving is something to do with the Judaic Christian religion. No doubt it's about it. It's sort of an aspect of Puritanism. Yep. And so I think that's the way he, he dealt with it. I think, I think now, of course, one would never well, use that language. And it's – well, it's you – know, you say it comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition. It, this whole di- idea of purposiveness, of having a purpose in your life that, that you should be striving for rather than, than enjoying the moment – is clearly yeah. a religious uh, idea. And I, I want to come back to that later because it – Yeah, I just wanted to add to what you said. I think remember the, the, the Bible where when God expelled Adam from paradise with yep. the terrible words, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread until thou return into the ground. You see, I mean the abundance of paradise was never to be regained till the afterlife yep. and one's lot on earth was to sweat, uh, um, to work by the sweat of thy face. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Now, you talk at, 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 in the opening of the book uh, why Keynes's – some of the, there are many possible explanations, of course, but let's talk about some of them. Why is it that we don't work 15 hours a week? Of course, many people do. Some do involuntarily. Uh, but in general, when the economy is healthy – People do work for 30 to 40 to 50 hours a week. They don't take that wealth, that productivity, and convert it into leisure, and uh, they want stuff. Uh, why did that happen? Yeah, why was yeah. Keynes wrong? 
What well, went wrong with I that think, prediction? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question, a very complex. Um, uh, there, there's a number of answers. I think one of the, one of them was that he thought of um, he thought of wealth in quant much more in quantitative terms. You know, you can only have so many houses, so many cars, so many pairs of shoes, clothes, so on. And once you'd got there, there was something called diminishing marginal utility, yeah. as economists call it. It's you'd that. get less satisfaction from each additional pair of shoes, pair of socks, and so on. And what that um, underestimated was the continued improvement in the quality. Yeah of goods, um, and an, an improvement that constantly tempts us to acquire the next generation of appliances of all kinds. I'm a bit of a sucker for that. I, I still are. think that my iPad 4 is going to be better than my iPad 3 and yeah. things like that. So I think, I think there, is, um, there is an increase in quality, um, which means that in a way you, you never have enough. Um, because um, the next generation always promises more. But I don't think one should concede too much on that head because many technical improvements are quite trivial. And, and I don't think would count as net improvements in our condition as at all if we took into account you know, the hassle of the extra work required to master them. Yeah, uh, uh, so I think that's one aspect, though. Um, I think there are others. Um, I could go on um, uh, to 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 uh, the more important one, I think, which is that he um, underestimated human insatiability. Yeah. Uh, we always seem to want more different than we've got, however much that is. And that's irrespective of improvement. And I, I, I just want to add, I mean, this is going to be a, a theme that's going to run through this conversation inevitably, this idea of insatiability. And it is, as you point out in the book, a very standard feature of economic theory, right? That yeah, yeah, more is better. Uh, I think more is always better. Well, in most yeah, modern, and more countries. is always better, and it's because we we our wants after a certain basic level, our wants are relative, not absolute. We're always comparing our fortunes with others. We also and compare. We them, always. We also yeah, compare them so. to our own youth, right? It's not just we yeah. compare them to others. We also look back on what we had when we were younger, and we want more yeah. relative to then. I think so. We compare them in, with the past. We also we either don't have as much as the next next guy, and we feel envious, or or we want to keep having more because we're snobs. You know, it, it's it's um that's that's very deep in that's very deep in human nature, um and uh, uh, and it's not just it's not just that. I don't know whether you know of an economist called. Tibor Skitovsky, who sure. wrote a book in the 1970s called The Joyless Society. Yep. And he also um, brought out this point of restlessness, um, an innate boredom or restlessness that we have, we, we, which also is a source of dissatisfaction. It's not quite the same thing as insatiability, but it feeds into insatiability. That's right. Um, yeah. It's the same problem. And, um, sorry. It's the same problem we have with distraction. Uh, we don't yeah. like doing nothing for a while. You can put a uh, an attractive face on these issues and say we, we, we're strivers. We, we're always seeking to better ourselves, which makes it sound good. Or you could make it sound not so good, which is your main theme really. So what's wrong with it? A lot of people well, think this is – I think, I think it means that you, you, you never get off the treadmill um, uh, because um, – but but then on the other hand, it's insane to stay on the treadmill. Um, there's another aspect of insatiability. In fact, a great American economist, Veblen, pointed out um, this uh, uh, um, this uh, quality of conspicuous consumption. Only it's very interesting with Veblen. Um, consumption, conspicuous consumption, was was the mark that you didn't have to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a mark of leisure. Yeah. Whereas what's happened in in, in recent times is that it's 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 become the product of work. You work more and harder and harder in order to have more conspicuous consumption. Um, and so the character of conspicuous consumption has changed. And that came out very much in a review of our book, rather critical review of our book, actually by Richard Posner, in the New York. New York Times, when he said, we can't really enjoy leisure without more and more gadgets. And so we have to work harder and harder in order to acquire these gadgets. Whereas uh, this is actually contrary to the spirit of Abler, and He thought that at a certain point, you would have enough um, uh, stuff um, in, order to, 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 um, in order to consume conspicuously, and you wouldn't have to work anymore. 
uh, a man who says that we need to work more and more to earn more money to buy the gadgets to enjoy our leisure is a man who's never yeah. sung in harmony uh, with his uh, with his fellow man or woman. Uh, um, there, well, there are um, many great I don't, joys. I don't disagree <laughs> with that. <laughs> I think uh, I think um, there's a lot to be said. Um, a lot. I, I, I completely agree. I, I think it was a peculiar review, but 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 um, but I thought it was. It was representative of a certain strand of American opinion, wasn't yeah. it? He's very conservative. Um, Richard Posler is very distinguished, but very conservative. And it just seemed to me that, well, it's one one view. Well, I, he also said that he also said in that review, if we have, if people had too much leisure, they'd spend all their time fighting, brawling, swearing, not getting up <laughs> in the mornings. So it's a very, it's a very it's a very particular view of human nature. That's dark. Um, on on his behalf, I've not read the review. I, I try not to read reviews yeah, he, of books that I where I'm interviewing <laughs> the author until later. But on his on his on his good side for your for your uh, purposes, he, he he became a big fan of Keynes after the crisis yeah, he, and wrote wrote a very uh, uh, adulatory essay of his conversion to Keynesianism, uh, which I challenged true. him on this program with, but in uh, a, a while back. But that that's another story. Let's let's get back well, to the book. I'm looking for I'm looking for the next conversion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it needs to come fully over, I guess. But I, I do. Th- you're right. It is a uh, uh, a particularly uh, a dark view of human nature. Some would say it's a realistic view, and I think that's part of what this debate's about. Or what, you know, what are we fundamentally about? What what are we capable of? Do we need to have work all the time to keep us off the streets? That's the implication of that. That's that the implication. Quote. It goes all the way back to the to the eighteenth century and even earlier. If 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 we didn't have to work, we'd be idle and dissipated and go to pieces. Work is the only thing that keeps us on the straight and narrow. Yeah. Uh, it's a very very old view. But then but then you see what about the um, the uh, the so called leisure classes of the past? Why <laughs> shouldn't shouldn't they have worked? No one thought that um, the nobles and gentry should um, uh, should uh, work more than they did. In fact, it was a mark of uh, a certain level of civilization that you didn't have to work. Yeah, correct. Well, they had they had good uh, genes. They thought they were they were better. Yeah. They were something else. Yeah, um, that, that's that sort of thing. <clears throat> You talk um, – we got off the track a little bit, but we think about insa- – let's go back to insatiability. Uh, if we yeah. think of this as a, sort of a trademark of modern economic theory, modern meaning going back 100 years or so, uh, where uh, people are, quote, maximizing utility, trying to get the maximum satisfaction from life th- through the use of, of goods. This is a – one strand of uh, neoclassical economics. It's – it's not the only strand within that that field, but it can become a, a, a sort of standalone view of humanity and how and rationality. And uh, yeah. you reject that. In fact, you indict it uh, as part of the problem. Why? Yeah. Well, I think I think it's the interpretation. I mean, in principle, if if, if well, there are two things wrong with it. First of all, it's it's very individualistic, and uh, your it's your own utility you're trying to maximize, and there's an assumption. That if people maximise their own utilities, then they're, 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 this will add up to the uh, to the to the maximum utility for the whole society. That assumption, I don't think, works at all. It, you know, the adding up problem is too great. But secondly, of course, maximising your own utility needn't be. Uh, maximizing goods it 's maximizing whatever gives you utility, and that could be leisure for example for sure um, but the way the way they 've interpreted it is actually uh, in 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 in, um, in, in uh, they 've interpreted it as maximizing your 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 consumption of of of, of goods um, goods produced by the market. I mean, that's the way I think maximizing utility is generally interpreted by economists oh. because it then links up with growth and that, and that, and that, that strand. So I think, um, I think, um, it's utilitarianism is wrong, but I also think that, um, economists, they, they, they pay lip service to the idea that they're not against anything you want to maximize. And if you want to maximize leisure, that's fine. But their whole emphasis on efficiency and, uh, and, and growth, um, really uh, biases them towards a certain interpretation of, of the, of the goals of human striving, which is making more and more money. Yeah, I don't know if that's a fair criticism or not. I, it's certainly a fair criticism mm-hmm. of how some of economics has been interpreted 
Um, I mean, I like to say economics is the is the study of how to get the most out of life, which is you can debate yeah. what I mean by that exactly. But uh, certainly, as you yeah, but it's but yeah, but it's it's how to get it's how to get um, the most out of least. <laughs> it's it's to um, some extent. Uh, you're you're always you're always doing calculation. You're trading off. Yeah, well, that's um, you're true. You're trading off uh, work for le- with leisure, um, and uh, um, uh, so there's there's always an element of calculation um, in 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 um, in what you're in what you're trying to do, and that's 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 part of their view of of, of the human beings, and that is not the same um, as 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 the um, idea Keynes looked forward to, when we shouldn't be counting the cost. I think there, there's there's um, a passage in that economic possibilities where he said we shouldn't be counting the cost of things um, uh, in the way we do now, and when we have enough. Uh, um, then uh, to lead a good life, then we needn't count the cost anymore, and that does seem to me where he breaks from 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 the economic uh, economics tradition and looks forward to a world without economics. Essentially, I mean, in the end, he says, "I hope economists will become as useful citizens as dentists," <laughs> which is you know they're useful for breakdown services, but yeah. um, their their view uh, they shouldn't be in any way a dominant position. And yet that's very, very different from, the, from what's true today, isn't it? I mean, economists really are the, are the pre, arch priests, high priests of our civilization. So you're certainly right that this, uh, this acquisitiveness idea, the idea of efficiency, the idea of maximizing is, is a modern idea. But it wasn't always the, the economic uh, tradition. Certainly Adam Smith was an eloquent uh, proponent of the idea that, that the goal of life is not to maximize how much stuff you have that there are non-mathematical aspects of life, non-maximizing parts of life. And uh, I also agree with you that we, we have become strongly interested in growth as a policy, whether that's the economist's fault or, or for politicians' fault or our fault as voters, but we do, we, do, we do like growth. And you critique that – you're very critical of that uh, policy urge. And you start, though, very interestingly – with two other critiques, uh, the happiness literature and the environmental literature. So start and tell us about why, what you like and don't like about their critiques of growth. Let's start with the happiness literature. Well, could I just, yeah, I will. Um, but I think this, this point about acquisitiveness of, and, and Adam Smith, um, the, of course Adam Smith didn't think that um, acquisitiveness was, was the be-all and end-all of life. But he did, um, he did uh, regard it as the method uh, acquisitiveness as a method for getting from poverty to to um, wealth, uh, and so in a way his his ideas unleashed um, acquisitiveness um, from their uh, um, traditional moral re- uh, restraints. And and the question which he never answered, in my view, is how do you then re- 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 rein in the Frankenstein's monster that you've created? Um, and that that was that's a big problem. I think we we try to we we, we discuss in 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 part of our book. Yeah. You, acquisitiveness is the method, and now what do you do when you've got there, so to speak, to where you want to be? How do you then abolish acquisitiveness? You've let it loose. On on happiness, um, yes, um, I think I think I think we. We felt, both of us as co-authors, that the happiness, the ideal of happiness, making happiness the goal of life, is is very vacuous. Um, we <laughs> thought rather of happiness, it, it's a purely subjective state of feeling. Yeah. And if if what you want to do is maximize this subjective state of feeling, being happy, um, then I think um, all you have to do is invent a psychic aspirin that makes you happy the whole time. I think drug dealers sort of promise something like that um, as well. But you wouldn't want to say about someone made perpetually happy by um, uh, being drugged or, 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 or taking, taking pills that that person is leading a good life. I think there's, there's a moral objection um, to that immediately comes and you, people will say, well, you know, we were built for something else. We were made for something else, not to be idiotically happy the whole time. So it's the subjective element there that if you want to make happiness, uh, maximize happiness, you're really wanting to maximize just a state of, a state of feeling. 
and uh, divorced entirely from um, the pursuit of those things that will, would justifiably make you happy. I think that's our main critique of happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of an achievement of doing something well, of realizing your potential, of flourishing, and things of that kind. And on environmentalism, I think the basic thing is, well, we're taking a bet that the science will bring, will bring acquisitiveness to an end. But suppose the science doesn't. Suppose we invent some technical fixes that will enable us to go on growing and growing and growing. And people are already saying, well, well, maybe we just set up shop in Mars. We'll, 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 um, we'll, um, we'll, we'll you know, have enough, have enough science to be able to do it. So I think that that check on growth comes in too late, and it may not come in at all. We may find some way of uh, going on growing um, by overcoming the environmental problem. Well, I, I think this is a nice. I mean, that's a great critique, and I, I think um, very provocative and um, one I'm very sympathetic to. What I'm curious is how you reconcile that with, with the Keynesian uh, idea of, of purposiveness being uh, not so important and part of our delusion that, that keeps us on the treadmill. So how, how do we get there from here? Uh, not policy-wise. I want to come and talk about that at the end. I'm just thinking about just the logic of your argument. As a religious yeah. person, I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea that a blissful life of free from pain is not meaningful. But for the yeah. average, you know, American culture, and I assume European culture to some extent also, that's kind of the goal. It's just lots of pleasure and not and minimize pain. And I agree with you. That's a thin life. Yeah. That's a thin life. It, but how do you justify that well, to the rest I, of the world? They don't seem to think so. Yeah, I think. I think it's a thin life. Uh, well, we, we have to we have to get back to ethics and, and ask the question: What 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 is, what are the ends of life? And 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 what would constitute a good life? That's an, that's a moral question. Um, it's it's independent of, um, of of what makes us happy or miserable. Um, though there there's a relation, of course. Uh, between those, but it is independent of that. So we have to ask ba the, that basic moral question. Is there such a thing as the good life? And there, um, the, criti the critic, uh, critique of our, our, our position is, well, uh, everyone has their own ideas of what the good life is. And um, uh, therefore, it's very wrong that you should sort of even try to lay down a law about this. Um, and shouldn't um, you know? Shouldn't the state confine itself to constructing a neutral set of rules, allowing people to pursue their own visions of the good life? Well, I think that um, although variety undoubtedly exists, there's much. It's much less extensive than is often supposed. I mean, all the religions and all the cultures across the world encourage, you know, certain things they regard as good. There's a very, very large degree of consensus about what is good. And we have to just look into, we have to look at those traditions. They're Christian traditions, they're Confucian, Buddhist, Islamic traditions. They all, they all, all their philosophers, you know, um, have, they don't say exactly the same thing, but there's a very, very large um, overlap in their opinions of what is good, what is the good life. And so we have to sort of uh, not reinvent those traditions, but we have to, we have to rediscover them. And, and so we have to decide ourselves what we think the purpose of life is. And then we can start reorienting our lives and start critiquing the idea that all, all, the only purpose of life is to get more and more goods, make us happier. I mean, this is all quite apart from the fact that getting more and more goods don't make us happier. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, that's another question. Yeah. But, but back to my question, there, there's no doubt an enormous cultural theme in, in, in many modern societies that the goal of life is to have fun. You know, you can dress it up yeah. a little bit as long as you don't hurt anybody, right? That, that's a, that yeah, is that's a it. parody. That's, about it. that's a parody of the libertarian philosophy. A parody of the libertarian philosophy is it's all about fun, but just don't hurt anybody. And as a libertarian who cares about something other than fun, I, you know, I think that rules out, that, that parody rules out joining with others to help other people, to create, to to play, to sing, to dance, to do all the things that, that make life, as you say, flourish and meaningful. And uh, I don't see any reason that, that you can't have uh, 
you can't have let allow people the freedom to pursue what they want and 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 have them they will can many of us can still do glorious things that you would call good but many people will not they they don't want that they just want to have fun are you what's your yes. mess, what's your I, message for them well well I, I think it's i think it would be very wrong to um equate lead, leading a good life with absence of fun <laughs> i mean you you mentioned the word you just used the word play yeah well, play is fun. Sure. Um, and there are many ways one can play. Um, and uh, and I think I think playfulness um, would be one of the elements of a good life because in playing you're not making calculations. You see, you're not thinking, well, am I wasting time playing <laughs> um, when I could be actually earning money? Right. So I think that I think it doesn't exclude it doesn't exclude play or fun. On the other hand, um, a life, I mean, one of our goods is security. Um, and it's very, very hard to um, have fun if you are um, worried about um, uh, your jobs or worried about where your next meal is coming from. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I think, I think the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the view to stress in all this is that – um, there is a lot of fun in leading a good life, but um, it's not just um, a continu continu continual expression of one's hedonistic and sexual desires. I mean, that, that is, I think, one of, the, one of the ways in which having fun is interpreted by our civilization, a kind of uh, perpetual infant infantilism almost. You just give way to every, 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 every desire you have the whole time. Um, and that's having fun. The fact is that it, it, it doesn't give you much fun, especially if you take a slightly longer view of it. Um, it, it comes back to this idea. You don't actually, I mean, if, 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 um, if, if your idea is to have fun, why actually do anything at all? Why not just give yourself a pill that makes you feel you're having fun? You see, you, you, you can't get out of the, you can't get out of the dilemma of in the end having to confront what is a good life. So and having fun doesn't get you there. So well again um, I agree with it, that but but not everybody does. So for those who don't no, agree. Fine. Those who don't accept <clears throat> actually why don't you why don't you lay out the basic goods that you think are the components of a good life and then we'll talk about what the challenges might be of this idea. Go ahead. Well we um suggest seven health security Respect, personality, harmony with nature, friendship, and leisure are our goods. They're not meant to be completely exhaustive, and they're not meant to be dogmatic. And they also link up with each other in, in rather complex ways. Um, but they're the basic goods. We, we think that without the existence of these goods to some degree in everyone's life, that life cannot be a good life. And how do those goods conflict with the modern view that says growth is good? Where does the, where does the, the idea of satiation or enough come into your, your view? <clears throat> well, I think, I think uh, the emphasis on growth um, to the exclusion of, of, of other things means that there is an insufficient quantity of these these. Uh, goods that I've outlined are being produced. Our society underproduces um, the goods that make for a good for a good life, and overproduces the goods that actually make for a bad life. I and mean, that's that's what that's what our basic argument is: that if you are obsessed simply with maximizing the quantity of consumption goods, this is just one example. You underproduce something else you want, which is friendship. And, and a sense of community, and as you put it, helping others. You also destroy nature. Uh, there are lots of things that a one-track obsession with maximizing economic growth um, destroy on the way, which are components of, most, of what most people would regard as a good life, and yet we can't get there. So, you know, my view is, is that as human beings, as you mentioned earlier, we have this urge for more and to strive. And I view one of the tests of our humanity is to not let that destroy us, not let that overtake us, not let that overwhelm our our time, as you point out. So I don't disagree with you, right? So where do we disagree? And I think where we disagree is 
I like to preach that. I teach it to my children. I'm happy to tell it to friends if they're interested. What's the justification for putting that at the center of public policy, which I think you'd like it to be? Well, you start from the insanity of not putting it at the center of public policy after a certain plateau of 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 wealth has been achieved you 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 have to regard it as insane to want um to have a thousand pairs of shoes um and if you think of the whole society as wanting more and more and more and more it is a form of collective insanity i mean that's how you start then you get into the question okay what alternative goals would reasonable people set themselves and then you get into the things we've talked about happiness or the environment and into the inadequacy of those as goals so you you're drawn you're drawn through almost peeling peeling uh, the banana skin to something that's more fundamental um, and 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 ultimately to the question what 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 um, what constitutes a good life and once you get to that question I don't think you'll get nearly as much disagreement as um, you've been suggesting I think most people do regard um, these as goods um, I don't think anyone would say that um, bad health is not a good thing or or, or that um, uh, security isn't a good thing. There are some right-wing idea, ideologues, as you've pointed out, who would say, no, 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 insecurity is the only thing that matters. Um, but insecurity, of course, makes not only for, for a bad life, but for unhappiness as well. So it, it fails on both those tests, whichever one, whichever one you choose to use. And similarly, most people are always saying they want more time with their friends. They're deploring the decline of, of, of community. Um, they, 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 they want more, more, more room to express themselves, more space to express themselves. Most people, when asked, would like to work less at jobs they have to do in order to develop other bits of their personalities, their hobbies, things they feel they could do. So you wouldn't get too much disagreement on a lot of this so why do we need it's to- not it's a bit of a it's a bit of a cliche i think to say that as soon as one starts a discussion then everyone goes off in all all all, all different directions i don't think they do it's not been my experience anyway no i think you're right i think i think many people uh who pursue happiness rather than meaning whatever you want to however you want to parse that regret it at some point, look back on their life with regret or uh, for whatever reason. The question is, again, what's the public policy uh, implication? So do you really think – I would suggest it's as much cultural as it is political that we have our attitudes toward money and meaning and friendship and time and leisure. I'm not sure it comes from the public policy problem. It comes from inside us, doesn't it? Well, of course, you, of course, it, it, it must do. Uh, you have to start um, from um, the individual and individual realization that um, uh, his or her own life um, is not getting to where they want it to. So there has to be this cultural shift, which I, I, would, I would say would, would be an ethical shift. And then if there are enough people um, who believe this, um, to be the case, um, then I think you start relying on the democratic process to reorient policy as in a democracy it should. I'm not, I'm not in favor of imposing the good life on people uh, by a set of laws. It would be impossible anyway, um, in, 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 certainly in, in any, any, any kind of free society. So you get, you get a sort of ethical shift go. Uh, and I think arising out of the dissatisfaction with, the, with, with, with many aspects of our present life. And then that can suggest ways in which the law can be shifted um, in order to reflect that. Well, and do, we, we do suggest certain, yeah, way, certain do, ways in which the law can, can help um, realize what, what, what is a cultural or uh, ethical shift. You do want to nudge people a little bit toward what your vision of the good life is. We want is. to nudge people. I mean, 
people are being nudged the whole time, only they're hardly aware of it. And a lot of people talk about how um, you mustn't interfere with anyone's liberty to do this, that, or the other, and that anything like that would be coercive or paternalist, and yet they ignore the fact uh, the extent to which the state already interferes with people's liberties in all kinds of ways. Even the American state does. Um, it's, you know, it, uh, it, uh, what about the security state? Um, the fact that more and more people are, uh, are under surveillance, the fact that more and more um, goods are really um, uh, uh, being, being um, prevented, lots of curbs on advertising, all kinds of things. Um, because uh, on the grounds that the state believes that they are harmful, um, we're not allowed to um, we're not allowed to um, indulge um, our free free choice in in pornography. The, the state already does do this. It already, in certain areas, does try to nudge people away from harm. We're suggesting that the nudging also include nudging them towards the good, always on, on starting from the, 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 the principle that there's enough agreement that this should be done. Well, I think the question is whether the st- I agree with you. The state already does a lot of this nudging and more than nudging in some states, obviously. The question is should they do more or less? I'd yeah. like to see them do less. I'd like to see the good yeah. life, the good life as you define it preached by people like you. I, I love that. I think it's a beautiful thing that, that you're encouraging people to look for meaning and not look for acquisitiveness and stuff, uh, as I think Adam Smith did in The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I think that's great. But I, what does this have to do with the government at all? Well, <laughs> the government might make it easier for people to lead a good life if they want to. I, wh- one, one example of that is the way work is organized. It should be easier for people to work less. Um, a, a lot of jobs come as full-time jobs, um, and you either take it or leave it. If you say, "Look, I want to work 20 hours a week because um, I want to, you know, I, I have other things I want to do uh, in my waking hours," there are a whole range of jobs which you can't do this in. Um, the organisation of the labour market, in fact, is a very, very powerful determinant of how, how much free time or leisure you've got. I would, I would be uh, perfectly happy, as they do in many European countries, um, to impose certain limitations on work hours for all kinds of jobs, not for all jobs. I don't think if you and I um, think we're doing a really creative job and want to spend 60 hours a week doing it, that uh, the state should come in and say, no, you're only allowed to spend 20 hours a week doing it. But there are a lot of jobs in which people are worked very hard, they're not creative, and they would like to work less. I think the state should help them uh, uh, to do that. Um, I think people are subject to um, uh, uh, an unbelievable bombardment of advertising. They think they're making. They think they're making all their choices freely. In fact, their choices, what to buy, uh, what to like, are being powerfully. Uh, shaped by um, what what they see on their television screens or internet, um, and I think um, you can you can find a way in which of lessening that bombardment. Now you might you might then say, oh, but that interferes with the freedom of advertisers to display whatever goods they want and the freedom of people to watch them. Yes, um, but in fact, these freedoms, I think, the freedom of people. Um, um, in that respect is actually much less than we think. People enjoy watching TV programs. They enjoy watching all sorts of things that are perfectly reasonable for them to enjoy watching, but they have to take a whole load of advertising with it. My only response to that is I think that, you, my only response to that is that yeah. I don't think uh, I'm suckered in. Uh, maybe I'm naive, but I, I, res- I, I, have, I have more respect for, uh, for folks uh, and their autonomy than, than you do, I suspect. Uh, well, uh, why do – yeah, well, you like may you be said, right. I want to why work, do advertisers if I want to work feel 60, it worthwhile to spend so much money on it? Say that again? Why do advertisers feel it's worth spending so much money uh, promoting their products? If, uh, because uh, if people aren't, aren't, uh, aren't whiters, um, if people aren't suckers. Well, because the world's or, a busy place. A lot place. of people aren't suckers. It's the same reason I tweet. What? It's the same reason I tweet, and you do too, I'm sure – and you know, I don't I don't spend much time uh, on other social media, but it's, advertising is just reminding people I'm out here. It's like waving a little flag. It doesn't mean I'm 
I, I wish I could convince people to read my books or listen to my podcast with an ad. That would be wonderful, but it doesn't seem to work that way for me. Um, but – just well, to keep up with I'm, the pace. I'm a bit more cynical than yeah. that. <laughs> well, um, not about. I, I think they advertise because they know uh, they, they think of it as a way of making money. Oh, they do. They Pure do. and simple. But the way they yeah. make money is, and, and often, and, yeah, Go ahead. and often, and often, um, they don't tell you. They don't tell you about their products. I mean, you don't need. You don't really want someone to remind you, um, a, a manufacturer, that he exists. You actually want to learn something about what he's producing. And um, a lot of ads don't tell you that at all. They just say, look, you'll feel a lot better if you buy our product. You'll be sexier. You'll be, you know, um, you'll be better in all kinds of ways. And that's just sort of a suggestion. Why do they bother with the suggestion if they think um, people, a lot of people aren't going to be um, influenced by it? That's the question I would ask. Well, I think they probably anyway. are. I think they are. No, I think it's a really interesting <laughs> discussion. I, I think they probably are influenced to some extent, but I think I could say all day long that uh, if you listen to Econ Talk, you'll get thin and make a lot of money and be very popular. Um, I can say that. I don't think it's going to work very well. Uh, and it, you could say, well, they say it better than I do, but I just think there's lots of. I, I really do think a lot of uh, advertising is merely uh, reminding people, but that's may, may, maybe a. Uh, that's a long conversation, I guess. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm yeah. gonna we got a couple, a few more minutes left. You say at one point, yep. economists have no ambition to remake human nature. They take people as they are, not as they should be. After all the horrors committed in the name of heaven and utopia, this seems to them a suitably modest stance. Um, you don't want to remake yep. human nature, either, do you? I don't want to what? Sorry. Re, you don't want I to remake human nature either, right? That's not your goal here. No. So. No, I don't want to remake human nature. I think you've got to accept a lot of, a lot of things um, uh, as, as, as just being part of human nature. But um, I think our criticism is that um, the way our um, civilization um, is constructed at the moment um, denies um, a lot of elements in human nature. We, they're not given enough expression. There is a bias. I mean, we are a commercial civilization. Our business is business. Um, I mean, business has become, I mean, I think it was one of the American presidents who said America's business is business. And now if, you, an if idiot. you're on, if it was you're on an train idiot on president, bus but... <laughs> or, or social media, what? It was an idiot who was a president, but go um, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but he said it. And now, I mean, if you're in a restaurant, you listen to conversations around the place. It's all about business. It's about doing deals. It's about, you know, um, how much can we borrow from the bank? What, what rate of interest? A lot, much, much more than it used to be. It, uh, the business uh, psychology um, has spread um, throughout certainly the Anglo-American types of society, which I'm most familiar with. It's probably less, less um, important in others. Maybe you... Um, so that's... that's an, that's an example of denying part of, of, of human uh, nature and, 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 and simply shaping it in, in, in one direction. Maybe you're eating in the wrong uh, restaurants. Uh, you know, I, I have to say I, I agree with you. There's a, there's a lot of the world's obsessed uh, with money. A lot of the world's obsessed with deals. But there are a lot of people who are obsessed with backgammon and stamp collecting and fantasy football and all kinds of bizarre human ex- forms of expression – Music, photography, they've never been richer than they are now. Never, never in human history have people had so much access to glorious creative opportunities and to share them with others. So maybe the glass is half full, not half empty. Well, I, I, I applaud all that. Um, but um, if you work uh, 50 or 60 hours a week, um, you even, even with your holidays, which are, which are, which are more than they used to be, um, you may not have nearly enough time, as much time as you want to um, do all these things. Well, and all we're saying is, all we're saying is, we should be getting to a point where people can make it make easier for people to make different choices between work and leisure. Um, you see, you, I, 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 I highly respect your position. You're an American libertarian who is also um, worried about um, the. Um, you know, the way society works, but doesn't want to do anything about it except 
um, by way of individual conversion. Yep. And I mean, that is, that is a, that, that's a perfectly uh, respectable position, but I don't think it's enough. Well, I, I care about the soul. Uh, you, you can say it religiously yeah. or, or just in a spiritual way. Uh, so I, I do think that should be an important part of, of our lives. And, and I agree with you. Yeah, you're right. I just want to do it on an individual basis. Uh, part of the reason is that I don't trust power to do what the Skidelskys want. They never have the powerful people. They do their own thing. So I assume you have some unease about making this too much a central role for the state. Yeah, of course. And that's why we have as one of our basic goods, I mean, it, 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 it limits anything the state can do. And that is, um, that is uh, uh, um, autonomy. Um, you know, we, 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 um, we, uh, and, and respect. I mean, those, those are central in our, in our list. Respect includes autonomy. We, we respect the choices of others. We do not try and coerce people. And that limits completely um, the, the, the amount the state is entitled to do in our, in our system. And we take that very, very seriously. But I agree. Of course, one should be suspicious of power. And one shouldn't um, allow allow it too much scope. I think I think perhaps the American tradition is a little too suspicious of power. <laughs> uh, maybe the European tradition isn't suspicious enough. That may be a cultural a cultural uh, yeah. a var- variation there. Yeah, it goes back um, to but it's a long conversation. <laughs> it goes back to 1776. Um, it it <laughs> may well be. <laughs> uh, l- let me. We're, let me close with one observation and let you, let you uh, give your response. The, your book's very critical of growth. We've talked about some of the moral dimensions of that and, and why happiness and environmental issues are not enough to condemn growth as a public policy. An alternative criticism of your, of your thesis, though, is that growth is what makes those good life characteristics possible. It's led to an – and, and it includes the commercial urge, the, 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 the acquisitive urge – it's that acquisitive urge that's led to the extraordinary division of labor, the extraordinary level of civilization we've been able to achieve, the leisure that we do enjoy in many, many ways, the longer lifespan, the actually better environment, more access to good parts of nature. Uh, there's more people hiking now, more people exercising, more people living longer, having the time despite their hours of work to explore the things that they love. Uh, that's all. That all comes from growth and um, – What's what's wrong with it? Well, and it sh- and it should be the and it should be the goal of many 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 uh, parts of the world where these things aren't possible still because of poverty. So poverty poverty um, is 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 uh, elimination of poverty is a very very is is the, must be the primary goal for people who live um, in poverty and therefore can't do all these things. But I put. I, you say, what's wrong with it? Well, nothing's wrong with it. Um, uh, uh, nothing's wrong with what growth has achieved, and it's made possible all these things. But go 100, 200, 300 years into the future. Do you still want all this just us to be growing and growing and having more and more things? Do you think there's no limit anywhere? Um, uh, because I think um, just to go on getting more and more and more um, – Rather than pausing and saying, "Look, let's enjoy the moments, um, and let's have more and more moments when we are not calculating um, um, life," um, is, is 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 something people. I think you know. I think that's 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 the position we should reach after a certain after a certain amount of growth. I just don't see how the world goes on along the lines you have just sketched. Um, it, it just seems to me that growth forever and ever can't be can't be um, a realizable objective or a sane objective. I would say. My guest today has been Robert Skidelsky. Robert, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.